whether it be to aid in the navigation of those phenomenal moments in history, when the world seems to exist on the edge of a precipice, only inches away from calamity, or merely to reveal what our ultimate fate may be. The ability to divine the future is a gift that we all crave at some point in our lives. For most of us, precognition is the stuff of fairy tales, a magical ability that has no place in a chaotic reality. Yet, at certain times in history, it would seem that some people have had strange and inexplicable knowledge of the future, and have prophesied events that have come true. In 480 BC, one of the largest invasion forces in history was assembled by the Persian king Xerxes I to conquer Greece. The contemporary historian Herodotus put the number of the invading force at around 5.2 million men. If this is true, then what Greece faced was not so much a war, but an apocalypse. Knowing that a great force was heading their way, the Greek city-states all sought aid from their gods. The oracle at Delphi was regarded as an intermediary of divine wills, and was as such the most renowned prophet of the time. It was to her that the city-states turned. After consulting her, it would be Athens and Sparta, the two most powerful cities, that would set the agenda for the Greek confederation that was forming to defend against the Persians. The oracle at Delphi was the high priestess of the Temple of Apollo a woman who was, without doubt, the most powerful woman of the classical world. Her prophecies, it was believed, were inspired by being possessed by the spirit of the god Apollo. To those who approached her, she would bestow counsel, influenced by her visions of a future dictated by the gods. When the Spartans approached the oracle, they were told the following. Either your famed great town must be sacked by Perseus's sons, or if that not be, the whole land of Lacedaemon shall mourn the death of a king of the house of Heracles. For not the strength of lions or of bulls shall hold him. Strength against strength, for he has the power of Zeus, and will not be checked until one of these two he has consumed. Her prophecy suggested that the only way to stop the Persian king from sacking the entire city of Sparta was for a Spartan king to fall. When the Athenians approached the oracle, the answer they got was also full of dread. Await not in quiet the coming of the horses, the marching feet, the armed host upon the land. Slip away, turn your back, you will meet in battle anyway. O holy Salamis, you will be the death of many a woman's son between the seed time and the harvest of the grain. A wall of wood alone shall be uncaptured, a boon to you and your children. The Athenians interpreted the oracle's words as indicating they should withdraw their troops to the Greek island of Salamis, where they would face the Persian army in bloody battle. For all her talk of death and conflict, the oracle did offer a tone of hope. When the Delphinians themselves asked the oracle how Greece could be saved from the Persians, she instructed them to pray to the winds. They will prove to be mighty allies of Greece. Soon after visiting the oracle, King Leonidas I of Sparta, along with an estimated 7,000 men from all over Greece, stood against Xerxes' great host at Thermopylae. Leonidas claimed to be descended from the demigod Heracles, and his name meant Son of the Lion. He and his troops occupied a narrow pass in the area known as the Hot Gates, believing that they could keep the apocalypse at bay. There, they cut to ribbons tens of thousands of Persians. They seemed invincible, until one of their own betrayed them. On the third day, the traitor showed the Persian army a secret pass that allowed them to encircle the Greek army. Faced with annihilation, many were able to retreat and fight another day. However, it came at a price. King Leonidas, 300 Spartans, and 700 Thespians sacrificed themselves to cover their withdrawal. And so, the king of the house of Heracles, with the strength of lions, fell to save the city. The oracle was also right when she predicted that the winds would be mighty allies of Greece. A large portion of the Persian navy was destroyed by storms, 
enabling the Athenians to inflict a naval defeat on the rest of their navy, capturing 30 ships in the process. Thus, while Xerxes might have been master on land, he was losing the sea, which was critical to keeping his vast army supplied. In an attempt to crush Greek morale, the Persian king pillaged the great city of Athens. Believing in the oracle's prophecy, the Athenians decided to retreat with their navy to the island of Salamis, which was less than 10 miles off the coast of Athens. In the Straits of Salamis, Xerxes thought he would hammer the final nail of his conquest with a decisive naval victory. However, the Athenians presented his army with a wooden wall of boats. With this, they were able to destroy the Persian navy. Thus, without any supplies, the majority of the Persian army had to retreat back to Asia. Those who remained were defeated by a coalition of Greek forces. Inspired by what had become the martyrdom of King Leonidas and his men at Thermopylae. Thus, the oracle's prophecy was fulfilled. Athens was sacked, but its people found refuge in the island of Salamis. A king died to save Greece, and the winds helped to crush the Persian invasion. And, since the war had encouraged the Athenians to build a strong navy, that navy would afterwards dominate the Aegean Sea, and would truly be a boon to them and their children. For centuries, the Knights Templar were one of the wealthiest and most powerful international organizations in Europe. Beginning as a small group of knights that banded together to protect Christian pilgrims on their way to the Holy Land after the First Crusade, they eventually grew into the world's first multinational corporation. Their services expanded to a wide range of activities, including international banking, with traveler's checks being issued to pilgrims in Europe to be redeemed in Jerusalem, a much safer way to carry money across the long journey. They also had a large army. At their height, Templar Knights were present across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, and even had their own navy. During the 12th and 13th centuries, they were Europe's premier financial and military power. However, all of this began to decline at the Horns of Hattin in 1187, when Saladin, the first Sultan of Egypt and Syria, annihilated the Templar army and took Jerusalem out of the hands of Christian forces. After that, it was a slow decline. The Knights Templar spent more than a hundred years trying to retake the Holy Land. However, they could not permanently regain it, and with that, they started to lose their reason for being in the eyes of many. Some started to question why this rich organization was being given so many privileges. Not only did the Templars operate banks, vineyards, and other businesses tax-free, they also enjoyed unrestricted mobility of their armies across Christian princes' borders. By the beginning of the 14th century, the Knights Templar was even contemplating forming its own monastic state, much like what had been done in Prussia and Rhodes. Whilst many were unhappy with the Knights' wealth and power, it would take more than petty grumbling for change to happen. A powerful organization could only be found by a powerful enemy. And, as bankers of Europe, they had many disgruntled clients who could become such an adversary. King Philip IV of France was heavily indebted to the Templars. King Philip had used large sums of borrowed money to fight the English, and now that he no longer needed the army, he began to scheme a way of getting rid of the Templars. Luckily for him, he was in a particularly fortunate scenario, for the Pope was living with his court in Avignon under his dominion. Not only that, Pope Clement V was his relative. Able to pressure the Pope to act in his favour, Philip engineered the spreading of rumours about the Templars. By the early 14th century, it was whispered that the Knights committed nefarious and lascivious acts during their ceremonies. On Friday the 13th of October 1307, Philip staged a massive, coordinated strike against the Templars. Scores of Templar Knights were arrested. On the 22nd of November, the Pope followed suit and instituted a papal bull that gave every monarch free reign to arrest the Templars and seize all of their assets. Over the next several years, Templars were burned at the stake for unsubstantiated claims, 
and were eventually entirely dissolved. When their defiant Grand Master Jacques de Molay met the flames in 1314, with his hands tied together in prayer, contemporary records reported his final words as prophecy. God knows who is wronged and has sinned. Soon a calamity will occur to those who have condemned us to death. A month later, Pope Clement died, and by the end of the year, King Philip of France was also dead. Henry VIII was King of England from 1509 until his death in 1547. He is most remembered for having had six wives throughout the course of his life, and for his controversial break with Rome, which saw England cut itself off from the Catholic Church and Papacy, and in doing so, fragment its relations with continental European powers. It was Henry's relationship with Anne Boleyn which is most commonly considered to be the primary motive for England's break with the church. At the time, King Henry was married to Catherine of Aragon, his first wife and mother of his daughter, Princess Mary. Distressed that he did not have a male heir to inherit his throne and that his queen was unlikely to give him any more children, Henry sought an annulment from the Pope which would allow him to put Catherine aside and marry another woman, in the hope of having a son. This, however, was not to be. Without the Pope's blessing, Henry empowered domestic English clergymen so that they, regardless of the Pope, could grant him the divorce he so desperately craved. With Rome's authority in England no longer recognized, the Crown began a policy of religious reformation which eventually led to the complete reorganization of the church in England and the dissolution of the monasteries. Many across England were unhappy with these changes and regarded Henry's new queen, Anne Boleyn, as the cause of their forced estrangement with what they regarded to be the true mother church in Rome. One of many people who had cause to be upset was Friar William Peto. Not only was Peter a fiery defender of Rome, known for his holiness of life, but he was also confessor to Princess Mary, the daughter whom King Henry had cast aside along with her mother Catherine. On Easter Sunday, 1532, the friar delivered a rather controversial sermon in the King's presence at Greenwich's Franciscan Chapel. During his sermon, he compared Henry to King Ahab, husband of Jezebel. Jezebel was associated with false prophets and blamed for having led Ahab astray. According to scripture, after Ahab died, wild dogs licked his blood. Peto thundered that if Henry should marry Anne, his Jezebel, the very same thing would happen to him. Just a few months later, Henry and Anne were wed in secret. When King Henry died in 1547, his coffin stood overnight in Sion Abbey as it made its way to Windsor for burial. According to a contemporary document identified by a 19th century historian, the leaden coffin had become damaged by the shaking of the carriage. This had allowed fluids to leak from the dead king's remains. In the morning, when workers came to repair the coffin, they found the pavement of the church was wetted with his blood. Not only that, they supposedly saw a dog creeping and licking up the king's blood. If this account is to be believed, Friar Peto's prediction had come true. God's judgments were ready to fall upon his head, and that dogs would lick his blood, as they had done to Ahab. In 1595, a Benedictine monk named Arnold Wyon published a history of the Benedictine order. Within it, he included a prophetic list of popes that he claimed was written by Saint Malachy, a 12th century Irish archbishop. Malachy, it was said, experienced a religious vision on a trip to Rome, during which he supposedly learned of all the popes to come from 1143 until the end of the papacy and Rome itself. In the text, the popes are listed with small mottos attached to their number. The first entry, for example, referred to the Pope being from a castle of the Tiber. Pope Celestine II, whose pontificate lasted from 1143 until the following year, 
was indeed born in a city on the Tiber River, whose name translates as Castle Town. Since the Prophetic List's publication, the debate as to its authenticity has been ongoing, even extending into our own times. Some have decried the list as a forgery fabricated by Wyon, and therefore not dating back to the 12th century. Certainly, it can be said that the Pope's mottos do seem to lose some of their accuracy after the publication date of 1595. That being said, it has recently emerged that private correspondence from an Italian cardinal dating to 1587 may shed some light on the list's provenance. In his letter, the cardinal stated that the next Pope, who would be the 74th successor to Peter, would be from the Dew of the Sky. Strangely, the Cardinal claimed that he knew this not because of any personal prophetic abilities, but because of the existence of ancient prophecies concerning the papacy, in particular, the prophecy of Malachi. According to the Cardinal, Malachi's prophecy contained more than 200 popes. As this letter was written several years before Wyon's list was published, it indicates that Saint Malachi and his 12th century religious visions were already known in certain circles. Not only that, in the prophetic list of 1595, the 74th Pope was assigned the very same description as given by the Cardinal in his letter. If the list was indeed a hoax created by Wyon in 1595, how was it that a Cardinal appeared to possess knowledge of the very same predictions years before? Intriguingly, the 74th Pope, Urban VII, did seem to fulfil the From the Dew of the Sky motto. He had been Archbishop of Rossano, where sap called the Dew of Heaven is gathered from trees. Those still sceptical of the list cite examples of mottos which appear to make no sense, such as the 109th Pope, John Paul I, being referred to as of the Half Moon. They state that such a motto does not seem to relate to anything, and that defenders of the list are merely clutching at straws. Those defenders, however, state that John Paul's papacy began with a half-moon, and ended with a lunar eclipse very soon after. Thus, his motto refers to the brevity of his pontificate. This same logic could be applied to his successor, Pope John Paul II, who, in prophecy, is known as from the labour of the sun, which believers claim refers to the solar eclipse that occurred at the time of his birth in 1920, and the subsequent one that happened at his funeral in 2005. Yet, for those who believe in the prophetic list, it is the 112th Pope which causes the greatest concern, for he is thought to be the last Pope. Worryingly, this is the number of the current pontificate. Unlike the previous popes on the list, the 112th pontiff is not given a motto. Instead, he is referred to as Peter II. The prophecy also states the following, Peter the Roman, who will pasture his sheep in many tribulations, and when these things are finished, the city of seven hills will be destroyed, and the dreadful judge will judge his people. The end. With Peter being the first Pope of Rome, elected by Christ himself, the name Peter II could be said to have ominous undertones. If Peter I signalled the beginning of the Church, Peter II could very well be seen as signalling the end. It would be very difficult to imagine any Pope choosing to call himself this, and thus may be more of a metaphor for how the 112th Pope will act. Even so, some have linked the name Peter to the current Pope Francis I, due to a vague connection to Pope Francis' namesake, Saint Francis of Assisi, whose father was called Peter. However, others claim that Peter II is symbolic, and that like the original Peter, the 112th Pope will be a good leader of the Church, and will help the faithful through many tribulations, as stated in the prophecy. Then, when these things are finished and the Pope dies, it will be the end of the papacy, and perhaps even the dreadful Day of Judgement itself. Despite these unsettling claims, some have stated that the prophecy does not read Peter II to be the 112th Pope, but rather, since it forms a separate paragraph from the list, it could mean that there are more Popes after the 111th before the final Pontiff is reached. 
Indeed, if one were to take the 16th century Italian cardinal's words literally, there may somewhere exist a longer list of popes given by Malachi, meaning that mankind is safe from the apocalypse for now. So Winston Churchill was one of the most remarkable men of the 20th century. He filled many roles in his life, a war correspondent who took part in a cavalry charge, a Boer POW who escaped captivity and lived as a fugitive in South Africa, Britain's first Lord of the Admiralty in the Great War, and later, and most memorably, the heroic Prime Minister who led Great Britain through its finest hour in the 1940s. Churchill was in his 60s when he led his nation against the most terrible war machine ever conceived by mankind. Yet, there was one person who had predicted this with incredible precision. Churchill himself, at the age of 16. It was a summer's evening in 1891, and 16-year-old Churchill and Merland Evans, a classmate, were talking together in a basement room of their headmaster's house at Harrow School. The young men's conversation turned towards the future. According to Evans, who recalled their conversation in his diary, Churchill stated that he had a wonderful idea of where I shall be eventually. I have dreams about it, he said. I see into the future. When asked about his dreams by Evans, young Churchill said that he could see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world. Great upheavals, terrible struggles, wars such as one cannot imagine. As shocking as this statement may seem, 16-year-old Churchill claimed to have seen more. He told Evans that he knew that London will be in danger, London will be attacked, and I shall be very prominent in the defence of London. At the time, Evans' response was one of disbelief. With the dreadful days of the Napoleonic Wars now long ago, he regarded Great Britain as forever safe from invasion. To this comment, Churchill supposedly scoffed, explaining that he could see further ahead than Evans. He restated his belief that their country will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion, by what means I do not know. But I tell you, I shall be in command of the defences of London, and I shall save London and England from disaster. During the conflict of the 1940s, hundreds of thousands of bombs were dropped on Britain with London experiencing 85 major raids by the time the war ended. Certainly, if ever the capital had faced disaster, it was when Churchill was leading the city's defences. Did Churchill's 1891 dreams reveal where he would be in 1940? Far from being a foreseeable path, his future career was hardly predictable. Churchill had multiple near-death experiences, was disgraced during the Great War, and later politically marginalised. Even when the time came in 1940, it was almost a miracle that he was chosen to lead his country over his rival Lord Halifax, whom many preferred for his conciliatory approach. The circumstances had to be precise for Churchill to have become Prime Minister in those tumultuous times. So how do we explain his supposed foresight? It could, of course, have simply been a great boast from an egocentric teenager. Yet, at the time, Britain was at the apex of its power. Queen Victoria, Empress of India and Grandmother of Europe, sat at the head of an empire that controlled nearly one quarter of the world's population. It was almost unimaginable that London, the heart of that empire, would be in danger. If one were to boast, it would make more sense to speak of conquering the rest of the world, and finish colouring the globe red for Britain. Churchill did not, however. Rather, he specified London and England, the centre of the most powerful global empire there had ever been, as being one day in his lifetime on the brink of disaster, and that he would lead its defences. Did Sir Winston Churchill really dream of the future at the age of 16? Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you have not done so already for more of the paranormal. And if you cannot wait until my next video, why not check out the one suggested on screen now. Until next time.